was one of the greatest pharaohs ancient Egypt had ever seen. The greatest builder, the most fearless fighter, and the father of more than a hundred children. But, as new evidence now suggests, could he also have been the unnamed pharaoh of the biblical exodus? He was Ramses the Great. Ramses' monuments stretch from his colossal statues at Memphis in the north to the temple of Abu Simbel in the south. In between, the Nile Valley is dotted with temples, palaces and statues built by a pharaoh the world would know as Ramses the Great. Ramses waged the greatest battle any pharaoh had ever fought. Outnumbered in hostile territory, he fought his way out when those around him were ready to give up. Ramses was a fighter. The only battle he may ever have lost was with the God of the Israelites. To understand the man who was Ramses, you have to go to Abydos, the most sacred place in all of Egypt. For thousands of years, pilgrims brought offerings here to gain favor with Osiris, the God of the dead. Today, all that remains of the offerings is the Hill of Pots, jars now broken that were carried by those pilgrims. Ramses' grandfather was the first pharaoh of his dynasty. They were a military family, new to the responsibilities of royalty. So when Ramses' father, Seti, wanted to show the importance of his family, he built a temple on the sacred ground at Abydos. Egyptologist Dr. Bob Breyer is our guide. He assembled the finest craftsmen in the land to give the people this dazzling display that once again, Egypt was great. Said he wasn't just building a temple. He was making a political statement. You can expect great things from my reign. This was Ramsey's father. It was a family of overachievers, and Ramses intended to do even better. And he did just that. When he became pharaoh, Ramses built a temple so tremendous, it would become synonymous with his name, and an icon for all Egypt. Ramses was only in his 20s when he began to build Abu Simbel. Located in Nubia, beyond ancient Egypt's southern border, it was a unique project. Most temples were built from blocks of stone, fitted together and then carved. But Abu Simbel was sculpted out of a mountain. New rock cutting techniques had to be developed. Artists were lowered from the top of the mountain on scaffolds to paint an enormous grid. This would serve as a guide for the sculptors, who then carved the four 20-meter statues of Ramses seated on his throne. But why build such an incredible monument in such a remote place? Never in Egyptian history had there been a large population there. It was a propaganda move. Ramses wanted everyone to fear his power. Nubia was Egypt's source of gold, and the temple was an awesome reminder to Nubians of Ramses' power.
anyone entering Egypt from Nubia would have to sail past the temple with its four colossal statues of Ramses staring down. If a Nubian stopped to visit the temple, he was met at the entrance with impressive carvings of bound captives, many of them Nubians. Once inside, the visitor could see Ramses leading the army in battle, the reins of his chariot tied around his waist, shooting arrows at the enemy. It was great drama, but it didn't end there. In the innermost part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, there are seated statues of the gods, Amun Re, Patar, Re Harakti. With them, and exactly the same size, is Ramses the Great, a god among the gods. But Ramses didn't stop with just one temple at Abu Simbel. He built a second one for his beloved queen, Nefertari. They were married as teenagers, and he clearly adored her. Above the entrance to her temple, he had an inscription carved calling her, She for whom the sun doth shine. Ramses began his reign with a flurry of activity. Egypt is a vast country, mostly desert, but it's the Nile that makes the land habitable. In ancient times, Egyptian settlements clustered along the banks of the river. Wherever there was a city, it was on the Nile. At Thebes, ancient Egypt's religious center, Ramses built more great temples, and across the Nile on the west bank, he had tombs constructed in the Valley of the Kings and Queens. But the real capital had always been at Memphis, 650 kilometers further north near modern Cairo. This is where the business of running the country took place. When Ramses came to power, he moved the capital to an area called the Delta, about 150 kilometers north of Memphis. Here, the Nile branches out into tributaries and the entire land becomes lush and green. But Ramses didn't move the capital there because of the climate. For a military man, there had to be a military reason that led him to build a city named Ramesse. It was the ideal place from which to launch a strike. North to Syria and west to Libya, Egypt's traditional enemies. So he built an entirely new city and dreamed of the hordes of treasure he could bring back to Egypt. This may even be the city that the Bible says the Pharaoh forced the Israelites to build. Ramses' new city became a bustling complex of palaces, temples, storehouses, workshops and barracks. It was from this new city that he would lead his legions to victory. Conquests that would make him Ramses the Great. By the time he was 25, Ramses was the leader of the largest professional army the ancient world had ever seen. The army was made up of infantry and charioteers. The infantry alone numbered more than 20,000. Their weapons were the battle axe, spear, and sickle sword. Because maneuverability was the key to success in chariot warfare, chariots had to be light. But this also meant that they broke easily. Today, only a few have survived. It took Nadir Lokma. Egypt's master wood conservator, years to restore this chariot, carefully bending the pieces to their original shapes. The chariot was made from different kinds of wood, elm for the wheels, because it bends easily, and ash for the body because of its strength. Each chariot was pulled by two horses and carried two men, a driver and an archer. The floor was made of woven leather thongs, covered with a leather flap. It acted as a shock absorber, 
and provided a relatively stable platform from which the archer could shoot his arrows. Ramsay's reputation as a fearless warrior was established at the Battle of Kadesh. There are more accounts of this battle than any other event in ancient history. The field on which Ramses fought was the ancient fortified city of Kadesh in Syria. Built on a hill, this site has been inhabited for more than 3,000 years, and today, a modern village can still be found at its summit. But soon it may be deserted. Salt in the soil and water supply has caused most of the inhabitants to abandon their houses. Now, only a few villagers live at what was once a strategic site of the ancient Middle East. Kadesh was crucial for Ramses' plan to control the Middle East. But the city was controlled by Hittites, warriors from what is now modern Turkey. They were Egypt's prime enemy, and Ramses intended to take Kadesh from them. In the second month of summer, in the fifth year of his reign, 20,000 soldiers followed Ramses out of Egypt. They planned to capture Kadesh and all the territory around it. The soldiers were divided into four divisions of 5,000, each division named after a god of Egypt, Amun, Re, Ptah, and Set. As Ramses rode out in his gilded chariot with the army stretching far behind him, he had no doubts about victory. Ramses knew nothing of defeat. Soon, Kadesh would surely be his. Ramses the Great was leading the most powerful military force the world had ever seen. They passed swiftly through Gaza, northward into Canaan and up through Galilee. When they entered Syria, they would have seen vast areas of green, strewn with wild flowers that were unknown in Egypt. And in the distance lay snow-capped mountains, probably the first time any of them had seen snow. Eager to reach his goal, Ramses rose early, put on his battle garments, and led the division of Amun towards Kadesh. Stretching many kilometers behind him were the other three divisions. As Ramses neared the Orontes River, two local tribesmen joined the entourage. They told Ramses that the Hittite king, Matwalas, upon hearing that Ramses was approaching, had fled with his army 200 kilometers north to Aleppo. To the young Ramses, this seemed perfectly reasonable. Eager for victory, he took only the division of Amun and pressed on, right up to Kadesh, leaving his other three legions to catch up. With the arrogance of youth, he had left the bulk of his army behind. Ramses decided to camp on a knoll that would give him a clear view of the fortified city. The next day, he intended to take Kadesh and all its treasures. But it was not to be. As Ramses set up camp, his sentries caught two Hittite spies. Beating the truth from them, it was revealed that Ramses had been lured into a trap. Matwalas was waiting in the woods, just behind Kadesh, with 40,000 troops. As Ramses and his officers made emergency plans, the Hittites attacked. Their charioteers charged out, cutting the lagging Ray division in half, almost totally destroying it. Then they headed straight for Ramses' camp, where chariots were being repaired, infantrymen tended to each other's tired feet, supplies were being distributed. They were totally unprepared for what was to come. Ah! 
Breaking through the barrier of Egyptian shields that formed an enclosure around the camp, Hittite chariots surprised the tired troops. With the Egyptian army in a state of confusion, Ramses took control. He cried out, Stand firm, steady your hearts, my army, that you may behold my victory. I am alone, but our moon will be my protector. His hand is with me. As Ramses rallied those around him, he jumped into his chariot, said a prayer to our moon, and charged. It never occurred to him that he might lose. Surprising the Hittites with his bravery, Ramses saved the day. Marshalling his troops, he charged the Hittites six times. Finally, the Hittite chariots were forced to flee across the river. Matualas, expecting to see hordes of infantry moving in for the kill, was amazed to see his men retreating across the river. A certain defeat had turned into a victory. The right hands of the dead Hittites were cut off and piled up so Ramses' scribes could easily count the dead. They may have won the battle, but the war wasn't over yet. The next morning, it was Ramses' turn to attack. After several charges, it was clear the Hittite troops were too well trained and too numerous to be defeated. It ended in a standoff, but the brave Ramses had achieved a great personal victory. Matualas offered Ramses a peace treaty. Both parties would accept a status quo and agree never to attack each other. But Ramses would have none of it. Still with designs on Kadesh, he agreed merely to a truce. So Ramses and his army marched home to his city in the Delta. He must have made a spectacular entrance, with Hittite prisoners displayed and tales of the pharaoh's incredible bravery. To record the event, Ramses carved the story of the Battle of Kadesh on the walls of all his temples creating the most detailed account of any battle in ancient history. It was a story that Ramses never tired of telling, and the Egyptians loved to hear it. But soon, he would have to face a totally different kind of battle, a war with the God of the Israelites. One of the great archaeological mysteries of our time is the biblical story of Exodus, one of the most crucial parts of the Old Testament. Supposedly, 600,000 Israelites left Egypt, but there's hardly any direct archaeological evidence to support it. And one of the central characters in the story may have been Ramses the Great. But did the Exodus really happen? According to the Bible, the Israelites living in the Delta had grown too numerous. In an attempt to control their numbers, the pharaoh forced the Israelites into building the store cities of Pitum and Ramesse. When the Israelites asked for three days off to celebrate a religious festival, the pharaoh not only refused, but said they would no longer be given straw to make their bricks. Brick-making in Egypt is still done in much the same way as it was in biblical times. Straw is crucial. It gives the bricks strength and keeps them from shrinking. The pharaoh, forcing the Israelites to meet their daily quota for bricks, now made them also gather and chop the straw themselves. <laughs> All Egyptian cities were built using mud bricks, and millions were required. It was hard work. 
An Egyptian papyrus describes the brickmaker. He is dirtier than vines and pigs from treading under his mud. His clothes are stiff with clay. His sides ache since he must be outside in a treacherous wind. He is simply wretched through and through. It was just the kind of task you would give to oppress a nation. When Moses, the leader of the Israelites, and his brother Aaron asked the Pharaoh to let their people go, he refused. To show the power of the Lord, Aaron froze his staff to the ground and transformed it into a snake. The Pharaoh was unimpressed. He'd seen his magicians perform exactly the same trick. The final confrontation in the Exodus story would be between Egypt's living god, the Pharaoh, and the god of the Israelites, who cast ten plagues upon Egypt. Moses said, I will strike the water that is the Nile with the rod that is my hand, and it shall be turned to blood, and the fish on the Nile shall die, and the Nile shall become foul, and the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water from the Nile. Even when it happened, the Pharaoh showed no fear, for he too was a god. He refused to let the Israelites go. The Nile always turned red during the season of inundation when the river swelled and brought rich red topsoil. The next plagues of frogs, lice, insects, locusts, boils and hail failed to frighten the Pharaoh. Because they were so like naturally occurring disasters, he dismissed them as coincidence. Still, he refused to release the Israelites. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. A sandstorm. But again, the Pharaoh had seen many and wasn't about to let his slaves go because of a natural phenomenon. But it would be the tenth plague that he couldn't explain away. Then says the Lord, about midnight I will go forth in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Heartbroken by the death of his firstborn son, the Pharaoh finally relented, and the exodus began. But even after the plagues and the death of his oldest son, the tenacious Pharaoh refused to give up. In one final attempt to avoid defeat, he mustered his chariots and set off in pursuit of the Israelites. And now came the miracle, the parting of the waters that allowed the Israelites to escape. When the army followed, they were swallowed up by the waters. The Pharaoh was finally defeated. The easiest route for the Israelites to escape to the Promised Land was through an area called the Sea of Reeds. It can still be found today. Part of the Suez Canal flows through it. This is a marshy area where people on foot might be able to cross, but chariots would find the mud tough going. Though not as dramatic, this might add credence to the Bible story. But whatever really happened, it was nevertheless a crushing defeat for the Pharaoh. It's debatable whether the Exodus, though a good story, really happened. If there were Israelites in Egypt, and if there was an Exodus, why is it missing from the Egyptian records? The Egyptians recorded many wars and battles on their temples, but if you read the hieroglyphs carefully, you'll find no losses. The Egyptians never recorded defeats. To find records of the Israelites in Egypt, you have to go back to the Bible, to a time before Exodus, to the Joseph story, and a clue to whether the Exodus really happened. According to the Bible, an Israelite named Joseph was sold into bondage by his brothers, who were jealous of his cloak of colored cloth. In Egypt, Joseph was unfairly accused of attacking his master's wife and was thrown into prison. But Joseph had a gift that saved him. He could interpret dreams. 
in prison, he accurately interpreted the dreams of his cellmates. Eventually, the pharaoh heard of his ability. Joseph was of particular interest to the pharaoh because none of his priests could tell him what his dreams meant. Seven fat cows being devoured by seven lean cows and then seven full ears of corn being devoured by seven thin ears of corn. Joseph interpreted this to mean that Egypt will have seven prosperous years followed by seven years of famine. Based on his interpretation, Egypt's economy for the next 14 years was planned out. During the seven prosperous years, wheat was stored in large granaries in anticipation of the impending lean years. When the famine came, it struck the entire Middle East. Egypt alone was saved from starvation. There is a flavor of ancient Egypt in this Bible story that may give it credence, as Egyptologist Dr. Bob Breyer explains. The ancient Egyptians believed that everyone had prophetic dreams. And if you wanted a dream interpreted, you came to a temple like this. The priest would go to the temple library and take out a papyrus that listed dreams and their interpretations. For example, if you saw yourself with a pygmy, it was bad. It meant that half your life was gone. Now Joseph's skill was that he could interpret the dreams that weren't in the book of dreams. Whoever wrote the Joseph story really knew what he was talking about. More evidence corroborating the Joseph story can be found on Sahel Island near Egypt's southern border. The island is covered with rock inscriptions. One tells of a seven-year famine. Though the Joseph story isn't the Exodus, it does suggest that there were Israelites in Egypt. And there's one more piece of evidence that indicates that something like the Exodus actually took place. It's in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. It even suggests that Ramses is the pharaoh of the Exodus. The famous Israel Stella is the only place in the Egyptian records where Israel is mentioned. A stella is a large flat stone erected in front of a temple on which an announcement is made. It's the Egyptian equivalent of the bulletin board. This one was created by Ramses' successor, Menepta, to boast of his military exploits. He was especially proud of conquering the Libyans and the mysterious sea people who had tried to invade Egypt. But here at the bottom, he talks about his military expedition to Palestine. He lists all the territories he conquered. Tehenu is desolate. Hatti is finished. Canaan is plundered. Then he says, Israel is laid waste. Its seed is no longer. On close inspection of the hieroglyphs, it appears that the conquered territories all end in the hieroglyph with three bumps or mountains. It's the sign denoting foreign country, but it's not Israel. It ends with a people hieroglyph, a man and a woman. That's because Israel isn't an established country yet. The Israelites were still a nomadic tribe. The Bible says the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before they settled in the Promised Land. If the Israelites were still wandering when Ramses' successor erected the stela, that would place the Exodus during Ramses' 67-year reign. The stela suggests that Ramses the Great was the unnamed pharaoh of the Exodus. There's one last clue to this mystery, and it comes from one of Ramses' sons. Ramses was a proud father. At almost every temple he ever built, he had his son's image carved on the walls. At Luxor Temple, they're shown together in a group. The first is Amun Herkepsha. The 13th is Menepta, who succeeded Ramses and became Pharaoh. That means that the first 12 sons died before Ramses. In the Bible story of the Exodus, the king's firstborn son dies. But when did Ramses' firstborn son, Amun Herkepsha, die? 
The answer can be found at Abu Simbel. Inside the temple, Ramses also proudly showed his sons. There, at the head of the line, is his firstborn, Amun Hirkepsha. He was certainly alive and well when this wall was carved. But another statue of him, outside Nefertari's temple, has two tall hieroglyphs at the end of his name that mean deceased. So Ramses' firstborn was already dead when Abu Simbel was completed, just after the exodus. We may even know where he was buried. Each tomb in the Valley of the Kings is numbered, and one of the most talked about tombs is KV-5, or King's Valley 5. Ramses built it for the sons who had died before him, opposite his own tomb, so they would be with him for eternity. When Egyptologist Dr. Kent Weeks began excavating it, it became clear that this was the largest tomb ever built in Egypt. to go on forever with hundreds of small chambers, rooms to hold mummies, rooms to hold furniture, clothing, and all the possessions that Ramses' sons would need for the next world. As Bob Breyer shows us. When the investigators began clearing the tomb, they found mummy bandages and bones and jars that once held the internal organs that were mummified. They also found inscriptions with the names of the sons of Ramses. What's really interesting is that modern scholarship now places the death of Ramses' eldest son at just about the time of the Exodus. Isn't it amazing? that this tomb is probably the burial place of the Pharaoh's firstborn son? The son whose death ultimately led to the Israelites leaving Egypt for the Promised Land? All the evidence suggests that Ramses the Great was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. The Joseph story shows that there were Israelites in Egypt. It was written by someone with an intimate knowledge of Egypt. The inscription telling of the seven-year famine on Sahel Island proves that a famine did occur in Egypt. And in the Exodus story itself, we're told that the Israelites built the store cities of Pitum and Ramesse in the Delta. Today, the Delta is littered with the remains of Ramesse's cities. Add to this the fact that Ramesse's firstborn died around 1262 BC, the time of the Exodus, and the possibility that Ramses was the unnamed pharaoh seems plausible. The Exodus didn't happen exactly as it's written in the Bible, but it seems as if something significant happened at this time at which Ramses was the center. That's why when we look on the face of Ramses the Great, we're probably looking at a character from the Bible. Could this man have actually known Moses? If Ramses was the pharaoh of the Exodus, this would explain the radical change in his behavior. The evidence supporting this is written on a temple wall for all to see. And this is it. It's the first peace treaty in the history of the world. And it's between Ramses and the Hittite king. It has everything you'd expect in a modern treaty. Non-aggression pact, end to hostilities, but the important term up there is that Ramses the Great promises not to trespass on the land of the Hittites, to take anything from it. He's given up Kadesh. For years he fought to keep Kadesh. Why is he willing to give it up now? I think the answer may be in Exodus. Ramses had suffered his first defeat. He'd lost his firstborn son. This may have been more than he could bear.
The exodus and the death of his firstborn and other sons were not the only tragedies Ramses had to bear. Abu Simbel was completed around the 24th year of his reign. Ramses sailed up the Nile with Nefertari to dedicate their temples. No king of Egypt had ever built anything like it. Of all his wives, it was Nefertari who was his friend and companion. She had accompanied him everywhere and appears at his side in his temple statues. But this was to be the last voyage for Nefertari, she for whom the sun doth shine. She died soon after their return to the Delta Palace. The Valley of the Queens was called the Place of Beauty, and there Ramses built the most beautiful tomb in all of Egypt for Nefertari. His beloved queen is shown as slender and elegant, ready to enter the next world. There she would take her rightful place with the gods. Ramses would reign for another 40 years without Nefertari. And from this time on, he was a changed man. Never again would he ride out of the delta to lead the army in battle. His thoughts had turned from conquest to building tombs and monuments. With such a large family, hardly a year passed when Ramses didn't bury a son, a daughter, or a wife. To create the tombs for his family, Ramses employed an entire village of workmen. Sculptors, painters, carvers, overseers, everyone needed to build a royal tomb, as Bob Breyer shows us. This is Main Street. It's practically the only street. This was the house of Kaha. He was a big shot. He was overseer of the workmen. Come on in. This is the parlor. And over here, we've got his kitchen. And this is where the lady of the house ground the grain. Come on. Because he was so important, he had two sitting rooms. And back here, a real luxury, a column for holding up the roof. He had three bedrooms, and he needed every one of them. He had eight kids. He was an important man. He was in charge of one of the gangs that worked on Ramsey's tomb. There were two gangs that worked simultaneously, a left-hand gang and a right-hand gang. And our man, Kaha, he was in charge of making sure that they worked efficiently. Everybody in this village had a specific job. Kaha's neighbor over here was a painter and a draftsman. Over here was Kawi. His title was guardian of the royal tomb. He was in the security business. They all worked for Ramses. It was a tight-knit community. Because they lived near the Valley of the Kings, they were isolated from other villages. They were also so far from the Nile that they needed a laundry service to wash their clothes. They bartered their skills to get what they needed. But the workmen didn't spend much time in the village. Their journey to work was a long one, so they often had to stay at the work site. Today, you can still walk the path they took to work. In small groups of three or four carrying their tools, they would have proceeded along here. And as they reached the top, they could see the whole of the Nile Valley below them. Beneath them, Ramses' mortuary temple was being built. Just over the ridge is the Valley of the Kings. This is where Ramses hoped he would rest for eternity. After 67 years of an extraordinary reign, Ramses the Great died in his palace in the Delta. His body was taken to the Embalmer, to the same workshop that had mummified his beloved Nefertari, Amun Hirkepsha, his firstborn son, and so many of his other sons and daughters. For 70 days it remained there as the mummification took place.
body was placed on a royal barge to make the long journey south to the Valley of the Kings. For three weeks, the ship bearing Ramses' body sailed upstream. The people of Egypt lined the shores to pay their last respects to the pharaoh who had ruled them well for nearly three quarters of a century. As Ramses' mummy sailed southwards, the women of the towns threw sand on their heads and tore their clothing in the traditional sign of mourning. When the ship reached Thebes, it was met by the high priests of Amun on the east bank of the Nile. There, his mummy was placed on a ceremonial boat for its last journey across the Nile to the west, the realm of the dead. When the body reached the west bank, it was transported on a sled to Ramses' funerary temple. There, priests recited the ancient prayers. Ramses was now ready to join the gods. Work on Ramses' tomb had begun 67 years earlier. Now it was ready to receive his mummy. As in the tombs of all the pharaohs before him, the stone sarcophagus was slowly lowered down a corridor, past the sacred text that would speed the pharaoh on his way to the next world, the book of the gates that would help him overcome any obstacles, and most important of all, the book of the dead that would assure resurrection in the next world. The corridor descended deep into the ground. Rooms had been carved, sculpted, smoothed and then painted, so the king could show the gods how he should be treated, like one of them. Ramsey's actual tomb has been the victim of both tomb robbers and severe flooding from the occasional downpour in the arid Valley of the Kings. But it's still a fitting memorial for Ramses the Great. The burial chamber is the largest in the Valley of the Kings and probably contained the greatest treasures ever assembled. As king of the wealthiest country on earth, Ramses had 67 years to gather the golden treasures he would take with him to the next world. This room undoubtedly held treasures far more spectacular than those of another pharaoh, the young Tutankhamun. By the time Ramses died, most of the men who worked on his tomb were already dead. Ramses had reigned for almost 70 years and for most Egyptians, he was the only king they had ever known. When Ramses finally ascended to the gods, Egypt wept. But the mummy of Ramses did not remain in its tomb forever. Discovered by archaeologists in the last century, it was taken to Cairo. But even this was not to be Ramses' final journey. In the 1970s, Egyptian curators discovered that the pharaohs in the Cairo Museum's mummy room were dying a second death. The humidity in the museum had allowed bacteria and fungi to attack the mummies for nearly a century. The mummy of Ramses the Great was sent to Paris to be studied and treated by a team of scientists. When Ramses arrived at the French airport, he received the full military reception befitting a visiting head of state. Ramsey's mummy was then examined at the Museum of Man in Paris. The X-ray of the skull shows teeth that are badly worn, many decayed. There's a hole in the jaw and an abscess around his teeth serious enough to cause death by infection, a condition that Egyptian physicians had no way of treating. Though this isn't irrefutable proof of what caused Ramsey's death, it's a strong indication that he must have spent his final days in agony. Many people are unaware that one of the most famous poems in the English language is about Ramses. Shelley's Ozymandias describes a fallen statue of Ramses that once looked down on the funeral procession that brought the pharaoh's mummy to the mortuary temple. I met a 
traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. And the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Ramses died in pain, a crippled old man approaching 90. But the ancient Egyptians believed that in the next world, he would be restored to his vibrant youth once again. Perhaps in the afterlife, he's somewhere in the west, riding out from the Delta Palace in his chariot, setting off on a new conquest with his army stretching far behind him. And when he returns, his beloved Nefertari is waiting to meet him with hordes of his children. As they gather round him, Ramses tells them of his victories and adventures. There were 11 kings of Egypt named Ramses, but there was only one, Ramses the Great. Tomorrow, Akhenaten becomes an ugly duckling king as the great Egyptians continues. On Discovery Channel next, test flights, recalling how pilots first met the deadly challenges of supersonic flight.